Welcome. Today I have five ways for you to help a homeless person safely and 100% free. Let's go through them. Let's say you got a specific homeless person that you see often. You'd like to be helpful, but you don't want to give them money and you don't want to bite off more than you can chew. What I have for you are five ways that you can help a person absolutely free. I lived on the streets myself with a shopping cart and two dogs. These each will make a huge difference in somebody's day. Number one, sit with them in a safe place and have a normal conversation about their story. Let you know you see them as a normal person. Number two, with their permission, send a card or envelope addressed to the individual to your own home. Once you receive it, bring it to the individual. This is proof of address and they will be able to use it to get food boxes, a library card and other services. It's not the same as saying they reside with you. Number three, offer to receive critical mail for the individual if there's a way to easily get it to them in a safe and timely fashion. Number four, drive the individual to get a food box or obtain a free food box for them, bring it to them and let them select the things they want. Number five, drive the individual to get food stamps, a social security card and or a state issued ID. Most homeless people have none of these without help getting them. Please press the plus sign for daily positivity. Peace. Everyone's just trying to survive under capitalism, and I am way past demeaning people for using Amazon. I still occasionally use Amazon. I have an Amazon Prime account. I'm not proud of it, but we live in a society. However, a little tip, every time you log into Amazon, use smile.amazon.com. You can set it up so that every time you make a qualifying purchase, they donate to the charity of your choice. So like a few cents of each one of my purchases goes towards the Equal Justice Initiative who have received $757,608.60 from Amazon so far. We may not yet be able to force Jeff to redistribute his billions upon billions of dollars, but in the meantime, we can force him to support anti-capitalist causes and that ain't nothing. Here are three tips for how to ethically stay in a hotel. First, when you're booking, make sure you're booking a unionized hotel. Check out some options at this website. Second, a lot of hotels are using the pandemic as an excuse to get rid of jobs. If they say they don't offer a daily cleaning, make sure you ask for one. And three, tip your housekeeper. An appropriate tip is $5 a day. Okay. So I just found some shit out that just blew my fucking mind. Racism really do be everywhere. So I want to say that there's at least like two major cities in the United States where you often see these. Uh, I'm going to call them a fleur de lis. If I mispronounce it, I don't give a shit about French. I, I don't. But apparently, like I just found this shit out today that they used to brand runaway slaves with the fleur de lis, especially like the slaves in the, the French territories and shit. When I say that Roe v. Wade is just the beginning, that is not hyperboil. That is not me fear-mongering. That is a very serious reality that we're facing, and I will give you examples. Just yesterday, police officers can't be sued for Miranda violations, according to the Supreme Court. Miranda v. Arizona is why we have Miranda rights, and it makes it so if a police officer does not inform you of your rights and then gets information out of you, that can't be used against you. And they're violating your rights by doing so. And according to this ruling, you can't sue them over that. Or how about in a 6-3 ruling, court strikes down New York's concealed carry law. And you know what this and the Miranda rights thing have in common? No one asked for this. No one came to the Supreme Court and was like, hey, I feel like this is unconstitutional. Or, hey, too many cops are being sued over Miranda rights violations. They just decided to do these things. And Clarence Thomas made it very clear what's next. Thomas, in his opinion concurring with Dobbs, calls on his court colleagues to next overrule Griswold on contraception, Lawrence on same-sex sex, and Obergfell on same-sex marriage. Griswold guarantees you can use contraceptives, so without it, a state can say if you get pregnant, you cannot have an abortion. That's illegal. But you cannot take steps to prevent a pregnancy in the first place either. And those others would make it where a state can say gay marriage, illegal. Gay sex, illegal. And while Clarence Thomas doesn't mention it because, you know, he has a white wife, Loving v. Virginia that says that interracial marriage can't be made illegal is also on that chopping block. Republicans are only 35% of the population, and not all of that 35% shares kind of extreme religious-driven views like this. And yet, 
people with those views have managed to control the majority of the Supreme Court. They represent the smallest collection of Americans and what they want, and yet they're applying it to all Americans. This is the fastest turn toward right-leaning ideologies in America's history, and it's happening while Democrats control the House, the Senate, and the presidency. And that makes no sense. Every single time fascism tends to show itself in this country, there's this response that comes from a lot of liberals being like, oh, I just want to move out of this country. I just want to move to Canada, move to Norway. And I want to talk about that real quick. Like, yes, I get it. This country is awful. It's getting worse and worse and worse. But moving to another liberal paradise is not the solution you think it is. These problems are just symptoms of a much larger problem, a disease that is plaguing this world called imperialism. Yes, the United States is the spearhead of imperialism, but that is a global issue. When you say you want to move to Canada, you just want to move to another country that's built off stolen land. When you want to move to European countries like the UK or Norway or Sweden or anything like that, you just want to move to countries that have robbed the global south through either colonization or neocolonialism to build the riches to build that society you want to be in. You want to live in a colonizer state that doesn't make you feel bad about living in a colonizer state. That's exactly why so many people were content with having Biden. The material conditions of this country did not get better, but Biden made you feel better about living in a colonizer state because someone like Trump kept making it very apparent how terrible everything is all the time. So when things like this happen, you once again feel uncomfortable the way you felt uncomfortable for four years during our last presidency. But like I said before, imperialism is a global issue and it is harming us in so, so, so many ways. When climate crisis really starts to hit the fan, it doesn't matter what liberal paradise you move to, you are also going to be suffering from that issue. And the worst part about it is you need to have immense amounts of privilege to just be able to up and move to another country. And all that does is leave marginalized groups in this country to suffer while you fled away from this problem. Yes, things are dark, things are bleak, things suck, but we need people to fight the fight, not run away. The more people that just run away and give up, the harder it is for us to help dismantle this thing and that's just going to suck for everyone down the road. And if you are feeling called out by this video, this is not a call out. I am calling you in to unlearn this setter colonial bullshit mentality. Take care of yourself, take care of your community and start to educate yourself and learn about how you can help make this world better, not just run away. A recent Supreme Court ruling says cops no longer have to tell you your Miranda rights that protect you from self-incrimination, so let's go over them right now. The first and most important is the right to remain silent. Everything you say can and will be used against you. It's true. You don't owe them any answers, so shut the fuck up. Secondly, cops will say you weren't being detained as a way of ignoring your rights, so ask explicitly and clearly, am I being detained? And thirdly, if you are being detained, tell them, I invoke my right to a lawyer. In summary, if the cops are trying to arrest you, ask if you're being detained, and if you are, invoke your right to a lawyer. After that, shut the fuck up. This my pussy, I can do what I want. Hm, I'm a big girl now. This my pussy, I can do what I want. Hm, I'm a big girl now. This my pussy, I can do what I want. Hm, I'm a big girl now. This my pussy, I can do what I want. Hm, I'm a big girl now. This my pussy. I don't think you guys realize the collective power we hold. All of you have got Tupperware. All of you poop today. All of you can collect the poop and use it in a special way and mail your poop to your politicians. And maybe a bib. So they get the message to eat your shit. They need to do their fucking jobs! Yay! Do their jobs! Yay! Fuck! Here's what people in power don't want you to know about how to organize effectively for social change. Growing up, you might have been taught that Rosa Parks was an old lady who got tired one day and sat down on a bus. 
That story deliberately hides Parks' decades of activism and the amazing, tireless, organized social movement that was working behind her to fight for social change. They want you to think that activism is a series of brave individuals, but it's a group effort. We work together, we fight together with the community. Let's talk tactics, going from what I learned as an organizer. When you're fighting for social change, you have to figure out your desired outcome and then work backwards from there. There are always two goals. The first is whatever you're trying to get changed. But the second, equally important, is to build a movement that is strong and able to take on bigger battles and win next time. These goals work together. It's much easier to sway decision makers when you can demonstrate that you have the power to reward them if they help you or create consequences if they don't. Every action you take should contribute to at least one of those goals, and ideally both. If you're working towards change at the local level, the meetings where big decisions are made are often very small, which means you can have a huge impact by showing up with 10 people and being ready to yell and scream at your local school board meeting or your local town council meeting. The right has been using this tactic very effectively to build local and national power, and we need to take that tactic back. If you've got a small group, bring stickers for people in the audience who quietly support you to wear. It makes your group look bigger than it is, and it gives you a chance to talk to people who might support you next time. And if showing up to that one meeting isn't enough, make sure you get the contact info for those other nine people so that next time you can all come and bring a friend with you. Movement building. For state and national politics, what we want is more complicated, but a key nexus for most progressive issues is unrigging the voting system. That means getting people registered, fighting voter suppression, getting people to the polls, and getting good candidates on the ballot. All of these processes are year long, not just in November. Check out my last video for tips on how to get voters to the polls. Check the comments for part two, how to use protests effectively. Like, comment, and share to get the word out, and then let's get to work. Here's what people in power don't want you to know about organizing effectively for social change. Part two, protests. Protests are important, but not always for the reasons you might think. Although we think of protests as ways to pressure people in power to do the right thing, most protests don't change policy directly. But that doesn't mean they don't work. Protests are great for movement building. People bring their passion to a protest, and then they're further energized by finding all the people around them who feel the same way and see the same problems and want to fix them. A good protest takes advantage of that energy and channels it into effective follow-up actions. But don't let that energy dis just dissipate after, because at their worst, protests leave people with the idea that they've already done something to make social change. And that expectations gap when people show up and expect that protest by itself to affect the outcome and then it doesn't, is why people start saying that protests don't work and get turned off from activism. People going to a protest are like thousands of drops of water. You don't want your protest to be a river where all that energy just passes through. You want your protest to be a power plant that channels that energy into something useful that's going to make change. Before you work on figuring out how to get people to your protest, build your power plant. At a minimum, your organizations should have folks with sign-in sheets to get people's contact information and connect them to future actions. Are you organizing a protest when you're not already part of an organization? That's great. Get people's contact information, and that's the beginning of your organization right there. You can also give people a number to text or QR codes to scan to sign up. Bring voter registration sheets. Contact other organizations in your community, and not just to get them to bring people to the protest, have them think about volunteer opportunities and invite them to talk not just about how important the topic you're protesting is, but about what ways people can help them. This is a great way to connect, for example, all the folks that are inviting people to go camping in their state with organizations that actually know how to provide that kind of support in a competent way. Take that energy and use it effectively. You can also do this to increase the effectiveness of protests you didn't organize. Just ask the organizers first. And then, go ahead and go around with your voter registration sheets or your flyers. Many protests encourage this kind of activity. Make your protest as safe as possible for the people who attend. Even if it's a small protest, make sure someone's brought a first aid kit, and if the weather is hot, some bottled water. If you're going to be including civil disobedience in your protest, make sure you announce it to the people around you before you start. Not everybody is in a position where it's safe to get arrested and you wanna make sure that they have the opportunity to opt out. Consider calling the National Lawyers Guild or the ACLU to see if they're able to send legal observers. Remember, 
No matter how big or how small, your protest is successful if the people who come leave energized, connected, and knowing what their next steps are. Like, comment, and share to get the word out, and then let's get to work. Come back for part three, where we'll talk about when and how you can use protests to directly affect policy.